Hi, hello, welcome, welcome back. I am Chris. This video was requested. This is the Pashtun leader who peacefully defied the British Empire from Alger uh, Algeria. Yeah, it's from Algeria. Al, Al Jazeera World Documentary. I almost mispronounced it a second time. All right, before we get started, click that thumbs up, subscribe to my channel. I'm, I've never done another video from this channel, so I'm not going to subscribe yet. You can do that for me, though. That helps out tremendously, unless you're going to use the same excuse I just used. You're not going to subscribe to my channel yet. That's okay. You don't have to. It's rude. I don't I, I, know. So um, you can also donate to the channel through the thanks button. All donations are appreciated. And if you do request a video, your name's sponsoring that video. All right. I'm going to break this down into three 15-ish or minute or read or short just video. January 1988, and the region along the Pakistan-Afghanistan border was in mourning. Three countries, India, Pakistan, and Afghanistan, lowered their national flags. A ceasefire was observed in the Soviet Union's war in Afghanistan as a mark of respect. Hundreds of thousands of people paid tribute to Bacha Khan. I'm sorry, India and Pakistan are, they hate each other, right? And both of them? Uh, basically, we're mourning together. All right. Tells me what were they enemies back then, though? Afghanistan war. So that was that the seventies. Afghanistan war was that the seventies? Was it the eighties? Why do I not know this now? I think it was the 70s. Okay. Interesting. A legendary Pashtun leader who was an activist and a pacifist, who influenced a generation in the fight against colonialism. My name is Munava. I come from Mardan, that I'm one of those few people left who grew up under the shadow of Bacha Khan. Uh, my grandfather, that is my mother's father, was a very close associate of his. I had frequent interaction with Bacha Khan. A lot of it I don't remember because I was young and his politics and philosophy was very deep and it went over my head but one of my first memories for instance is I must have been seven or eight years old when um, my father took me to one of his jalsas it was an enormous collection of people with red flags waving everywhere and there, there must have been to my little mind millions of people over there that was the first memory I have of Bacha Khan, of this huge man who stood there and talked uh, in Pashto, of course, uh, to these thousands of people. He was a man who believed in uh, the good of everybody. A photograph was taken by somebody at that time. It was his last living photograph. Bacha Khan's real name was Abdul Ghaffar Khan, meaning King of Chiefs, reflecting his historic importance. He was born in 1890 in the northwest province of Punjab in what was then British India. Khan was born in a country under colonial rule, and he spent almost all his long life fighting what he saw as British oppression. Before the arrival of the British, the people of the Indian subcontinent were acting differently. They were not homogeneous.
India was divided into different states, into different provinces, ruled by different princes, different people and different tribal chiefs. There was no regular central government. Means they were not under a strong central government. That's why they were being conquered or they were being occupied by the British easily, step by step, one after the other. Let on after the War of Independence, which we call mutiny in the British record, but we call that the War of Independence. Jange Azadi in 1857, the Indian lost in that war. And what happened that in uh, 1858, the all India, the entire India, that uh, instead of uh, ruling by the East India Company, uh, that uh, shifted to the British Parliament. Britain's influence in India was vast. Queen Victoria had the title Empress of India and reigned over much of present-day India, Bangladesh, Myanmar, Pakistan, and Afghanistan. Afghanistan lost as a result of... I'm just throwing it out there, but I'm, I'm willing to be the emperor of India if you want it. Um, no new taxes. Um, uh, railroads. Uh, balloon parties. Whatever it takes to get the title. I mean, I'm, I'm cool with that. Just don't expect me to actually go there and do any other work. I'm too busy. I got a lot of karate tournaments all around the world, so I can't do that. But I am willing to take the title. And maybe like like a little crown. No, that's a... a like a Burger King crown. I'll do a Burger King crown. I'll do that. Two Anglo-Afghan wars of the 19th century, Afghanistan lost three things. Number one, sovereignty. Number two, half of its population, number three, and uh, the Pashtun land. The Northwest Frontier Province was separated from the Punjab. It was make a separate province. And actually the British divided the, the tribal area, or separated the tribal area through a different line. The people of this area are Pashtuns, a large ethnic group living in parts of Afghanistan and Pakistan. There are tens of millions of Pashtuns and they're mainly Muslim. Many are farmers and traditionally, they have tribal structures, but there are several theories about their exact origins. The history of Pashtun is actually a controversy. Means different historians have different uh, uh, interpretations or different histories of the Pashtuns. Means some of the historians uh, portray the Pashtuns as uh, the last tribe of uh, the Jews. The second theory is the Pashtuns are the real Aryans. And the third theory is mixed race theory means the Pashtuns are the combination of the Greeks, the Turks, and the Persians, as well as the Jews. But they have been developed into a single nation, and that is what we call Pashtun, or Pashtun, or Afghan, in a broader sense. The area was dominated by Muslims. This was an overwhelmingly Muslim majority area. 93% of this area of the population was Muslim, and only 7% were non-Muslim. Then the ethnic division of the province, 56% in the central districts, they were Pashtuns. And then followed by Hindkowans, then even Gujars, then Kuestanis, and some other races.
Actually, the Pashtuns since medieval times, they have been regulated their lives through their traditional customs, traditions, and uh, their way of life. Pashtun Wali, that is what we call Pashtun Wali. It is actually an unwritten constitution of the Pashtuns through which they regulate their daily lives and through which they interact with other people. So Pakhtun Wali is really a code of life and you know it has certain components. My own view is that Pakhtun Wali is a code made by men. Uh, of course it is meant to apply to the whole of society. That the Jirga, which is really the you know the forum of elders that decides disputes and, and, and sort of mediates, uh, the, the Jirga uh, traditionally in our areas is all men. But Shah Khan grew up in this male-dominated Pakhtun Wali tradition. His parents were well off by the standards of the time and were able to provide their children with a broad education. Bacha Khan was born into a family of landlord. His father, Baram Khan, was a landlord and he had uh, to his entitled some eight villages. And he was a chief uh, Khan of Uthman Zay. He had four daughters and two sons. So he sent his eldest son, Dr. Khan Saib, he became a doctor later on, to study uh, medicine in England. And he also sent Bacha Khan to school for education. Bacha Khan got early education from Madrasa. That was only uh, memorizing the Holy Quran and reading the Holy Quran from his own village, Uthmanzai. But afterward, his father admitted him in missionary school, which was a boarding school in Peshawar city, uh, the legacy of the Edwards Mission School. So even the idea was that he was supposed to go for his higher education to England. But then uh, his mother was reluctant and he said, I have all, already uh, like losing one child going so far for education and I don't want to lose you. So Bacha Khan then listened to his mother uh, will and he stayed there, he stayed back. His father advised him to join army. For the recruitment in the British army, they had a special regiment, which was called the Guides. Bacha Khan narrates that an incident occurred and it changed my whole outlook. There was a Sikh officer, but the Sikhs, you see, they are used to of keeping long hair. And then a Tommy. Tommy were those officials who newly arrived in India from England. So he started beating the Sikh officer without any reason. And he abused him by telling him that you want to imitate us, the British. This was the turning point in his lifetime. And he came back. He informed his father that I will not join army because this is an insulting job. But Shah Khan's short army career sowed the seeds of his anti-colonial activism. His British Army Regiment, the Guides, was an elite group of Pashtun soldiers. However, the young activist viewed the white colonizers as arrogant, racist, and cruel, men whose oppressive laws prohibited any form of dissent. When the American colonies um were helping with the French and Indian War when the British were were um, in the Americas and, and everything that happened. Uh, they were trying to join the ranks of the British, and and some did, but they looked at the rest of the colonies, like the militia and stuff like that, as less than. And so when the British Army would come over 
and they would go do their thing. They wanted some militia with them, but they treated the militia better than they treated uh, the people here, but they treated the militia basically as, oh, these backwards people. They don't know how to fight. They don't know how to do this. Meanwhile, the colonies have been fighting the Indians, Native Americans, whatever you're supposed to call them, and we're learning new tactics of let's not stand in a row. Let's hide behind trees. Let's, hey, when they're, when they point a gun at us, let's duck. How about that? Let's try that out. See if that works. And the British are kind of like, ah, those, those are, those are coward ways. And it's like, well, you got shot in the face and I didn't. So who do you think's well off here? And, but the whole point of what I'm saying is that they, they treat us much better than this, but they treated us the same way. They looked down at us because we weren't them. We weren't, you know, we were the cousins who went to America. We were far and away different. We wore raccoon hats, you know, raccoon skin hats. Who, who are we? Beaver hats. Like, who are we? We're not the gentlemen that they are. So when I'm hearing this, I'm like, you, yeah, I understand. Although on a scale of one to 10, you're at a 10 for being treated like garbage. We were probably like a, a three and a half to four, but of course we thought it was like a six, but this, I think even George Washington, all those back then would have looked at and been like, damn, maybe we should, maybe we should kind of get away from the cliff here because, uh, it's certainly not as bad as how they're treating them. <laughs> it was actually, uh, uh, a draconian law and, uh, where a, a, a whole tribe would be responsible for a, a crime of a single individual. There were some other legislations like Ghazi Act, wherein even gazing straight away in the eyes of a British soldier or a white man, you are liable for punishment. You have no... That's like... That's like what we did to slaves. And by we, I mean the you know the american colonies you know that was like and i'm i'm not giving you know but that was the type of thing that they did with slaves you know don't, you can't look a white man in the eye that was in fact some black people were told that like into the early 1900s don't look a white person in the eyes if you're walking on the street and they're walking down the street on the sidewalk cross the street stay out of their way leave them alone like th this is inhuman in terms of how you look at somebody. I'm understanding why this guy, but I don't, the peaceful part still blows my mind, but I'm understanding. I wasn't in that situation, but I certainly understand. No right of appeal. But the world was changing at the start of the 20th century. Global alliances were shifting in the years leading up to the First World War in 1914. The Ottoman Empire was in decline, and Bacha Khan was concerned that these changes might create a kind of moral vacuum in his region. So he decided to set up an Islamic school in his hometown of Uthmanzai in 1910, in what was then called Northwest Frontier Province. Soon, other schools also sprang up. Pashtuns were becoming better educated and as a result, far more resistant to colonial rule. This coincided with increasing British fears of Russian expansion from the north. The Punjab government did not allow any reform package to be implemented in frontier area. Obviously, they were doing it for one purpose, because Russophobia. The British wanted to keep the Pashtuns of the tribal areas isolated from the Pashtuns of the settled districts. So they, they have been actually the target are the victims of their own geostrategic location. Yeah. 
the Pashtuns were still in the very early stages of their resistance to British rule and had no clear strategy for opposing colonization. But Jahan joined forces with another Pashtun activist called Haji Sahib, who'd fought the British in the late 1890s and who'd supported Khan's school project. Butcha Khan could have followed Sahib's path of armed resistance, but then had second thoughts. Butcha Khan joined him, but during that journey, Butcha Khan was not happy with the practices of running away and having a rifle with him, and he, he thought it's not an idea to fight uh, or to work for his mission of education. So he stayed there at a mosque. Uh, they say it, it is said there for 40 days. And he just uh, read the Holy Quran. And out of the Holy Quran, he got this idea from those principles of non-violence that was preached long ago uh, by the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, Muhammad uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And when he came back, he also opened his change of schools. All right, we're going to stop it there for part one. I understand wanting to take up arms, I do. Especially when you when you meet somebody who has fought them. Um, the peaceful method is, is the best choice. Unless he had a, an army, you know, a bunch of people that were willing to die for it. But any kind of resistance like that is going to bring bloodshed onto people who don't really want any part of that. And so it's the peaceful way is better because if you're peacefully um, defying things, they're just going to come after you. You know, you're putting yourself out there. While if you're, you know, if, if you're standing there in a crowd and you shoot a soldier, the soldier's just going to turn and start shooting everyone there in that crowd because they don't have time to focus on who, who was it, where was the gentleman at, because people are just going to start scattering and they're just going to start shooting. So peaceful is always better, but I completely understand when you're looking at how they were treated. Oh, I understand. I get it. Completely get it. Anyways, I'm going to end this here. This is part one. We will be back with part two. I have to get a beverage. I kind of want tea. I'm not going to make it. I got to figure out what I'm going to do. I don't know why I'm sitting here and just recording. So I'm going to end this video here. Have a good day. Have a good night.